So in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about different types of states. Um, what are the different kinds of states? Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about, you know, how electorates are constituted, and then um, think about uh, uh, different kinds of social movements, um, of which there are other lectures on social movements. So if you're really interested in that, you should look for those lectures as well. So what types of governments do voters in democratic countries want? So it's important to note here that democracies vary. Not all democracies are the same. Some democracies are welfare states, some are corporate states, and some are liberal states. You know, this is a, a, a classic um, kind of classification of different kinds of um, uh, uh, states. Welfare states, just sort of most simply, are states that have a lot of social programs that they pay for. Corporate states are commissions that bring together labor and capital to negotiate over things like wages. So they basically work with both labor unions and corporations to try and facilitate an interaction between the two of those that are desirable. And liberal states tend uh, towards less regulation and lower taxes. Um, uh, fewer interventions into the economy. So welfare states are governments that provide lots of services with higher tax rates. Sweden is a classic example of a welfare state. Corporate states emphasize collective bargaining. Basically, they think of themselves a little bit as a broker between corporations and workers and facilitate the interaction between those two groups, extracting from both of them in order to provide services. A classic example of a corporate state is Germany, and then liberal states are where the governments are relatively more economically open. They try not to intervene so much within the economy, and they tend to tax at lower rates. These are different kinds of democracies. So in welfare states, which are usually seen as like in, in Northern Europe, the Scandinavian states, um, uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, to a lesser degree, Finland, um, are viewed as welfare states. Corporate states, Germany, France, um, are examples of this. And liberal states, the US and the UK. There are many other states that fall under this umbrella. The idea is that not all democracies are the same. Some place greater emphasis on the importance of social programs. Some place greater emphasis on the importance of um, an unregulated market. The electorate are um, uh, uh, the set of people who are allowed to vote. Um, you know, if you believe that voters drive policy, it really, really matters who gets to vote. And um, in earlier time periods, voting was severely limited. So in ancient Greek society, only wealthy men were allowed to vote. In American society, for a long period of time, only white men were allowed to vote. And um, uh, uh, you can think about the expansion of voting rights and what that means. Democracy, you should recall, is very rare until about 1800. And there have been many arguments about who has the right to vote. So excluding voters has been critical to a lot of political action. A lot of political parties work very hard to exclude certain kinds of voters. This might mean that immigrants can't vote or uh, immigrants um, can vote in municipal elections, local election policy, but they can't vote in federal elections. It also uh, could mean that particular groups can't vote. So you can control policy if you can control who votes. If you think about the median voter theory as being responsive to the middle voter, um, then what the median voter theory does is it responds to those people who can legitimately vote. In 19th century America, politicians prevented blacks from voting by imposing taxes and literacy tests. tests. Um, the constant use of democracy is who can vote and why. So universal suffrage says that everyone gets an, a chance to vote. But even within universal suffrage, there are often pushes for disenfranchisement, adding or subtracting voters. Um, and so uh, people constantly fight over this. So here, um, the state is the state of Louisiana literacy test, which was given to people um, uh, uh, to prove a minimum fifth grade education. So basically, the state of Louisiana used to say, if you don't have a fifth grade education, you shouldn't be voting. 
Um, and so uh, it, it said, you know, it would basically give this test to people. Um, uh, uh, in, and, and this test is like, you know, it's not um, uh, uh, that hard, but it's pretty hard. And I, I'll say that in Louisiana, when people came to vote, they would give this test only to black people. So when white people walked in, they wouldn't give them the test, but when black people gave in, they would give, give them the test. So number five says, circle the first first letter of the alphabet in this line. Now, that first letter of the alphabet is A, and the first time that it appears is in the word alphabet. So you would circle A in alphabet. Number four says, draw a line around the shortest word in this line. And so that would be A. Um, but you could imagine people getting this wrong, maybe circling in or the. Um, uh, draw a line under the last word in this line. Draw a line around uh, the number or letter of this sentence. Um, I don't even understand that one. Draw a line around the number or letter of this sentence. Oh, so you would draw a line around one. Um, actually, I'm really confused by that. In all likelihood, interestingly, you should look at this slide. I would get the first one wrong because I'm actually not clear what, on what it's asking. So all of this shows like um, these literacy tests were used to disenfranchise voters. And before you think that, oh, this is a thing of the past, just note that today there's still massive, massive pushes to disenfranchise voters in the United States, to make sure that certain people can't vote. Um, and in particular, um, there's big attempts to make sure that racial and ethnic minorities can't vote. So in many states, people convicted of crimes lose their voting rights. And so when the imprisonment rate went up in the 1990s and 2000s, millions of people lost their right to vote. Now, as we've said before in this class, the rise of mass incarceration wasn't just a racially benign rise, but black people were much more likely to be convicted of crimes. And I'll note that this is not just the people who are currently incarcerated are unable to vote that people who are formally incarcerated are not necessarily allowed to vote. Currently, there's a series of struggles in Florida to allow people who've been formally incarcerated to be, to be allowed to vote. And the Republican Party in Georgia is working, I mean, in Florida is working very hard to try and make it so that these people can't vote. Why? Because those people are likely to vote for Democrats. And so the view is not, it, it's, it is a very simple, thing that like if you've already served your time and presumably you have done what society asked of you given the infraction that you had, you might, you should be able to re-participate in democracy. But um, given that former felons are people who are likely to vote Democrat, the Republicans are working pretty hard to make sure that they can't vote. Um, and, you know, is this a political statement of mine? I actually don't think it is. Uh, uh, um, and I think, you know, we either have commitments to universal suffrage or we don't. But voter disenfranchisement, a process of making sure that voters can't vote, is a way that politicians do politics. Um, and we'll say that uh, three sociologists estimated that if people who had um, uh, 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 left prison kept voting, their vote kept their voting rights. So like, in other words, people who are no longer in prison and, uh, but still had voting rights, uh, the 2000 election was likely to have gone to uh, a Democrat. So it's not that these are inconsequential. Um, uh, it, you know, basically the, the votes in some states are very, very close and finding ways to exclude, say half a million voters, um, two million voters, uh, from voting. Most people vote at low rates anyway, but if suddenly, you know, a quarter of them voted, if half a million people voted and they vote, you know, 70% Democrat, it's a good way to make sure that you're more likely to win an election if you find policies to exclude them. So um, one way to have, to skew a median voter theory is to exclude a bunch of people from voting. And in the United States, millions of people are excluded from voting. Most of those people are racial and ethnic minorities. 
And there are policies that continually are extended and extended to, to try and limit the capacity for, for people to vote, um, in part uh, for political outcomes in order to continue to improve. The civil rights movement was in no small part about voting rights for African-Americans. So a key issue in that movement was getting African-Americans the right to vote. Why was this so important? Well, partially because if you don't vote, the state will not enforce for be interested in your rights. So even though the, um, uh, many African-Americans formally, African-American men uh, formally uh, had the right to vote after the end of the Civil War, so in the 1860s, it took a century for um, uh, African-Americans to really have full voting rights, um, in part because it wasn't until the um, uh, early part of the 20th century that women were granted the right to vote. So African-American women didn't have the right to vote. But more importantly, that like um, uh, uh, even if they had the right to vote, things like those literacy tests and other things like um, uh, uh, poll taxes uh, made voting very difficult for African Americans, particularly through the South. A poll tax for, is an, uh, is another way that people are excluded from voting, and actually some states are starting to uh, create poll taxes. Um, they're not; they wouldn't call them poll taxes, but basically checking to see do you owe any money to the state, and if you do, not allowing you to vote. And poll taxes are ways to exclude poorer people from voting. So it's a tax that you have to pay when you vote. Um, and all of these things are things of, that attempt to disenfranchise people from voting. So we've talked about with poll taxes, class and voting, and with the civil rights movement, race and voting. And then we should also note women and voting. That women were excluded from voting in most places that, and this led to the suffrage movement in the 1920s. So again, I'll just say that for most of American history, women were not allowed to vote. Um, and uh, the appearance of women voters in the 1900s transformed American politics. Uh, policies became po differentially possible once women became a critical voting bloc. Um, uh, here we see uh, political leader Alice Paul, who helped organize the suffrage movement and organize it through a, uh, uh, um, an amendment, a constitutional amendment. So we've seen examples of women, of racial and ethnic minorities, and of people of cla different class positions having been excluded from the right to vote. Why spend so much time on this? It's not just history. It's actually something we're living today. So it's something that in many democracies, there is a struggle over who gets counted as someone who can vote. Are immigrants counted? Are people from different ethnic groups counted? Are women counted? Are people from different class positions counted? If you're homeless, can you vote? It's actually really hard to vote if you're homeless. You can't prove where you're from. What district do you vote in? There are lots of policies that seek to disenfranchise typically more disadvantaged people from voting. And so democracies aren't just the process of people voting. Instead, they're often something quite different, something where um, part of the process of, de of a democracy is defining who are the people that politicians should be responsible. Now, the key process in any de de democratic society is voting. And voters um, elect a politician or party or vote for an alternative. And what is it that um, voters want and what should we listen to? We often talk about public opinion. And if you read the newspaper, you'll see all the time um, in different societies, you'll see like, what is the public opinion? People will be surveyed on their attitudes or something. And here you're sort of measuring the trends or averages um, of what people might support. Um, so if some policies receive 
very widespread support. So Gallup polls show that a majority wants to keep immigration at its present levels or decrease it. In 1966, only 7% of the population wanted to increase immigration. In 2017, that rose to 35%. But on average, most voters do not support more immigration. So only 35% of Americans think that immigration should be kept at its present level or, I mean, that immigration should be increased. In general, um, uh, uh, people have like kind of complicated views about immigration. So, you know, um, uh, uh, through the 1990s, people increasingly said we should decrease the level of immigration. Um, uh, and that sort of declined down to um, about 34%. But right now, I'd say roughly a third of Americans think that immigration should stay the same. Um, a third think uh, it should decrease, and a third would think um, it, it should um, increase. So what does this mean? Well, it's actually not so simple to interpret. Um, it's not so simple to say, oh, this has a clear implication. Um, that's partially because of ideologies. Um, People have systems of beliefs or political orientations, but that those systems of beliefs are not always consistent um, and they tend to exist as packages, as groups of ideas that don't always align. So some beliefs are popular while others are relatively rare. And the two ways that American society tends to be divided is between progressives or liberals who think that government should actively tax and redistribute wealth and social conservatives who think that the state should support religious and traditional values. Um, uh, they tend to have an economic position, but the economic differences are pretty um, complicated. And we can estimate the popularity of certain kinds of ideologies by seeing if people vote for the relevant political party. So, you know, um, uh, Democrats have in general um, a greater share of the popular vote. Um, uh, they've had a greater share of the popular vote in uh, most elections since 1992. Um, uh, 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 there's only been one election, I think only one election. Yeah, only one election where Democrats since 1992 didn't win the, pop win the popular presidential vote. That was in um, uh, uh, 2000. Um, uh, so they, they lost the election then, but they still had the popular vote. Um, and right now, political parties tend to uh, line up with ideologies. And this means that there's a high degree of polarization in a society where people split into kind of two pretty clear camps that are kind of far away from one another. Big question relative to these two camps and whether um, uh, uh, how, how we respond to them is whether or not it makes sense to actually listen to people in terms of what they want. So politicians often say that we should listen to the quote unquote will of the people. And we might ask ourselves, is it a good thing to listen to the will of the people? So, you know, um, this is a good place to think about ethics. Um, if we know people have mistaken or harmful beliefs, what types of government should be instituted to minimize the effects of those beliefs? Um, so people have lots of mistaken beliefs. People thought that slavery was acceptable. The majority of Americans thought that slavery was acceptable. Does that mean that politicians should enact slavery because the majority wants it? Or should politicians think ethically about what they want? Um, today, most people um, uh, think that immigration causes problems, even though most social science research on the issue shows that it isn't a problem, that immigration isn't associated with declines in wages and immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than other groups, as we talked about in a previous lecture. So what does that mean if people think that immigrants lead to lower wages and more crime, but they're wrong about it? They're actually wrong that immigrants don't um, result in that. So what do we do in that case? 
some instances, people may be unaware of facts. So most people believe, for example, that foreign aid is a huge part of the U.S. budget and needs to be cut, but it's far less than 1% of the U.S. budget. And so people have a lot of mistaken beliefs. Um, you know, the U.S. Constitution is in part designed to help mitigate these problems. That is, it's designed in order to allow a certain or pretty high degree of authority to political elites. So there are different branches of government and popular votes are filtered through legislation so that people don't have a direct influence on policies all the time. And part of that may lead, for the lead to the possibility of more ethical decisions. But what those ethics are could be highly contentious. Other good examples of things like this are instances of sex and gender, um, where we could think about the, uh, what political preferences are about this and what states end up doing. States often regulate and create social inequalities. So state governments passed laws that prohibited um, same-sex marriage for many years and that didn't allow LGBTQ people to do all kinds of things. And this, beyond a political inequality, just an inequality in how people lived, also was an economic inequality. Um, that many of the benefits, the economic benefits of marriage were excluded from LGBTQ couples who may want to enter into that institutions. And states often engage in the regulation of gender and the family. They regulate birth control, they regulate marriage, they regulate sexual behavior. For this reason, sociologists think that government is one of the way, ways that social hierarchies are created and maintained. This helps us think about what politicians do as a form of political expression. And that part of what politicians do and part of what politics does is to help create some of the hierarchies within our society. So can you think about ways that states are involved in rules about gender, marriage, sex, reproduction, and so forth, and where these policies come from? This doesn't just have to be about you know, the American state. You can think of lots of different states and how states help create gender through the sets of policies that they have in relationship to gender. I'll give another example here one that we talked about in the family chapter. The United States has no uh, guaranteed paid leave for parents. Um, and so uh, in, uh, in the, the women who become pregnant and who have children uh, may have the guarantee of their job after some period of time. Um, I think it's uh, six weeks. You know, I, I could be slightly wrong on that, but it's not very different. But in the six weeks that they're not working, they're not guaranteed to get wages. So this is a gendered policy that pushes women out of the labor market and has real consequences for their overall capacity to work. It also helps create certain kinds of gender relations where um, it pushes women to be more dependent upon men. It's an important aspect of that policy. And it um, creates gendered inequalities where men are more likely to get, become higher earners within labor markets. All of this is important to understanding how gender works in American society. And in other societies, if you look at the welfare states that we talked about before, that work really hard to provide social provisions, you see that gender works differently there, not just because people have different attitudes towards gender, but because states regulate gender differently. So in those places, there's guaranteed paid leave. And it's not just for women, it's for parents. And parents can distribute it between them. So men can take a portion of the leave and women can take a portion of it. In some instances, if men take leave, they get even more leave. So there's a way that the state seeks to incentivize men to take parental leave. Why? Because they want to create more equality for raising children. So men are encouraged to take a little bit more time off 
by taking by doing that encouragement, men become more involved in the basic work of raising children. So state policies create regimes of gender, but they don't just do this for gender. They do this for all kinds of other things. So we, we see how states create status hierarchies and how states may potentially challenge hierarchies or be subject to challenges of the existing hierarchies in the society. Social scientists are really interested in the kind of routine forms of political influence like voting. So we spent a lot of time in this on voting behavior, but voting reflect what people already think. Um, uh, um, uh, and sometimes groups have to resort to protest in an attempt to change a society. And this is called social movement. And I talked a little bit about social movements in other lectures, so I'm not going to deal with it as extensively here. But social movements are a critical form of political action. They're actions by collections of people and organizations in response to state policies to try and change state policies outside of the voting process. So social movements are things that say another way to move state policy is not through voting but through collective mobilization. And that collective mobilization makes clear to politicians what problems are, what solutions are desirable, and what potentially the next election might look like if you're not responsive to them. So there are different kinds of movements. There are left-wing movements that often ally themselves with lower status groups, um, ethnic and racial minorities and women, um, people from lower class positions, et cetera. And those tend to seek social and legal equality. They tend to favor the redistribution of wealth. Right-wing social movements tend to ally themselves with higher status groups and push typically for things to stay as they are. They could also push for the continuation of the current majoritarian dominance. Um, so uh, different militia movements, for example, typically push for the continuation of, say, um, uh, 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 an approach to the uh, American society that has um, white men at the center of that um, uh, uh, society. And then revolutionary movements want to topple the government, create a new government, often through violent means. Now, these uh, right-wing movements can be revolutionary movements, left-wing movements can be revolutionary movements, and sometimes movements that don't even have a revolutionary end in mind end up being revolutionary. Um, uh, uh, so the Bolshevik movement, which I'm not going to spend any time really talking about, was initially, this is the Russian Revolution against the Tsar in the early part of the, 19, uh, the 20th century, was just a move, when it started as a women's protest movement that turned into a revolutionary movement. The most classic example that sociologists look at when they look at how movements can fundamentally transform politics is the civil rights movement. Why? Black voters made up a very small proportion of the electorate. They made up a very, very small proportion of American society. And many of the things that they picked, pushed for were not desired by the majority of American voters. And yet, there was huge legislative change in light of that movement. So it shows how sometimes massive political change happens not because the median voter is supportive of it, not because pluralist organizations kind of start negotiating over political power to realize something, not because elites are interested in it, but instead because everyday people begin to protest and through that protest question the legitimacy of the state. Remember um, uh, that the definition of the state is um, uh, uh, the legitimate use of force over a given territory or the legitimate monopolization of violence. Um, within a given territory. And what movements often do is say, you have this series of policies that are not consistent with what you claim is legitimate about your state. The American state claims to be a democracy that centers equality within that democracy. And we are here to say to you, you are not doing that and you are not legitimate. 
And this question of legitimacy, this questioning of legitimacy by movements can often move states to enact policies that they might not otherwise enact. Um, I'm not gonna spend much time talking about the civil rights movement. If you're interested in that, go and listen again or listen for the first time to the lectures on social movements where I talk about the different ways in which social movements are done. Um, but I'll just remind you that central to social movements are organizations that the sociologist Alden Morris pointed out that the success of the civil rights movement was due in part to using the church as a platform for action and how church, churches provided central organizing function to the movement so that movements aren't just groups of people pouring into the street, they are also the development of and, re and reliant on organizations to do a lot of the work for that movement.